The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. It's time to talk about the movie that answers the question, does every goddamn story need a gritty reboot? What if George R.R. R. Martin took on Disney? The longest Evanescence video ever. That's right, it's American McGee's Snow White and the Huntsman. What the fuck? Um. Hey everybody, this is Michael T. Bradley. And J. Wilford Neville. And we are here to talk about Snow White and the Huntsman. Starring uh, Kristen Stewart, Charlize Theron, and Chris Hemsworth, and some other people. Uh, in honor of this movie and the way that it decided to uh, uh, take on the English language, we have decided from here on out, we are going to use faux British accents of some varying degree. And we apologize in advance if any of our listeners happen to be across the pond. But this is, this is important. <laughs> Every line to sound important must be given this crazy accent. <laughs> Let's start out with a what the fuck moments. Fold if you want to begin. Eternal Youth Statue of Liberty Yogurt Bath. A convenient beach horse. Helpful magic magpies. Oil clums? What the fuck is up with this forest? This is a Treyu and Artax all over again. The dark forest is so bloody dangerous, yet Snow White sleeps in the middle of it. No problems. Carrion eating butterflies. I have to capture this chick alive in order for my queen, my <laughs> sister, myself, all of those things, two of which are the same, to survive. <laughs> My plan? Burn everyone while they're sleeping. <laughs> What's the little person equivalent of blackface? Charlize Theron's fucking raven outfit. Why did we have to make Snow White a messiah story? Everyone keeps molesting Snow White's insensate body. The editing of every single fight scene. The line... I would rather die today than live another day of this death. <laughs> what the fuck does Which that even mean? <laughs> I don't know, but if you deliver it with a slight British accent <laughs> and intense meaning, it almost no, it just it no, really it's doesn't make a stupid. lick of sense. It's still stupid. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's one of Case Stew's worst line she has to deliver in this film and I, I have to say she was given a lot of shit for this role and did you notice in the trailer she was damn near edited out of the film the trailer is what what made me choose this as a film for what the film because a the trailer screams please like me <laughs> it, it, it's like we have chicks that turn into ravens we have Chris Hemsworth being hot. We have all of this stuff. And, oh, maybe Kristen Stewart's in it as a title character. But you'll, fucking... see her, you'll see her occasionally. No, she has no lines. and She probably is. It's not important. No biggie, but Charlie Theron's in it. It's great. Come enjoy the movie. <laughs> do you suppose that it's even necessary to actually do a plot summary here? It's snow bloody white, right? Right. It's basically... <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's basically, basically it's Snow White. The dwarves have normal person names. They're not like sleepy, bashful, shit face, whatever <laughs> the Disney ones were. In this one, I, I believe the dwarves are murder, raspy voice, mumbly, <laughs> uh, drunk, and Gus. I actually started looking up the names because the first one's name we find is Beef, and I thought... Oh, is that some sort of Celtic word, word meaning Papa Smurf or whatever? It seems as if most of the dwarves were named after Celtic letters of the alphabet. Ah, <laughs> uh, it's handy. <laughs> Ex except Gus. <laughs> Gus. Gus is not, not, not a Celtic rune. <laughs> I don't believe so. I didn't bother looking that up, but maybe it is. Maybe it's like the third branch of Ogma, Gus. <laughs> <laughs> Gus. Yeah, basically it's the story of Snow White. They give sort of a prologue as to how she winds up with an evil stepmother, which is she tricks her father into marrying her and then murders him. Snow White is 
a princess, and then uh, that's Kristen Stewart, and then evil stepmother, which is uh, Charlize Theron, we- weasels her way into the castle, marries her father, murders him, takes over the kingdom. Uh, she holds her in prison for an indeterminate length of time, maybe two years, maybe twenty. Can't quite tell. The middle tells her that uh, uh, Snow White is a, a danger to her beauty when she comes of age. Right. So I so, assume somewhere around uh, uh, five to eight years. Yeah. Something like that. And the whole kingdom's died in the meantime, and then she escapes thanks to helpful magic magpies through a shit tube. Very Johnny English there. Or Elder Scrolls 3. <laughs> Four. I don't, I don't scroll up for. I guess she eats an apple and falls in censor. It's it's and your basic everyone, Snow and White. Molests her. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so she's Jesus for a little bit there, and then she's Joan of Arc for a little bit there. Yeah, so I. The final countdown. And that's pretty much it, right? She, she right. faces off against the evil stepmother, and then she stabs her. Ugh. And for some reason, even though she'd been stabbed before, this time it kills her. And also, even though k had stabbed several people in the courtyard in the battle leading up to it, this time the stabbing was, like, a big deal to her. Yeah. That's right. The <laughs> end. So, I, I thought it was a bit uh, harsh of people... To come down on case to she won uh, the Razzie Award for worst actress for this and for uh, uh, one of the one of the Twilight movies came out this year as well, but I, I I thought that was a bit ridiculous. I thought she did what the script demanded of her. I don't know. I I, I tried to picture throughout this movie what it would have been like if say. Natalie Portman had been in the lead role or someone who can actually act because Kristen Stewart she really can't like she can do simpering and that's basically that's basically all she does she never shuts a fucking mouth and she has this sort of whiny way of opening a line with a glottal stop like <sighs> my only main real problem with Kristen Stewart as an actress is that Every time she's supposed to look upset, she starts hunching as if she's got a wee Sibian beneath her. I I don't understand that acting choice. Otherwise, however, I, I don't know. I've never seen her with any in anything that has a script worth a damn. Yeah, per- perhaps that's a problem is she just keeps getting cast into movies with utterly shit scripts and directors. I heard there is a, a movie where she plays uh, someone in a band and she's amazing. So I don't want to give her the benefit of the doubt, but I I don't know. This is just a piece of garbage. <laughs> this this movie. It it felt to me as if somebody was like, I really like Game of Thrones, <laughs> but I don't want to have to do all that world building and time involvement. So what if I just shoehorn that sort of world into a classic tale? I know what would work. Snow White. It definitely did have the look. Did you notice how very much Charlize Theron's crown looked like Sauron's crown? Uh, I did not, because I bloody hate Lord of the Rings uh, and everything to do with it. It looked like it was made of bayonets. I did, however, notice that Throne had a bit of a jagged edge to it. As if it were the the crown of spiky things that apparently all the Game of Thrones fanboys love. Also, I noticed that uh, she's a fucking Dementor, and at one point she morphs into <laughs> Voldemort. That's true. So, so there is definitely a bit of Harry Potter in there. So let's talk about all this backstory that may be in the original fairy tale. I don't know. But all this bloody backstory, first of all, Snow White's mother is inspired by pricking her thumb or pricking her finger on a rosebud and then is like, if only I had a daughter who fit weirdly specific nature metaphors. <laughs> and, and then she does. She has that child, which is a little odd, but good for her. And then the mother dies. 
And then her dad finds a victim of war, supposedly, that of course she's she's uh, manipulating him, and she, she's the mastermind behind that entire battle, but he, he finds this chick and he's like, you're hot, and he moves fast, <laughs> for they are wed the very next day. <laughs> Yeah, I, I thought that was a little strange. I actually made a note about that, um, that there was a very strong emphasis on beauty and vanity in this movie. And it's like the most destructive force in the world is the vanity of a woman. Correct. Especially the vanity of an old woman. It was very ageist. Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I thought it was very strange that like he was plunged in the depths of grief for his dead wife. And then... Uh, I, he uh, meets a more beautiful woman. He's like, oh, all right. She wasn't that great after all. I'm better now. Let's get hitched now, immediately, tomorrow. It's a, it's a very uh, disturbing film for that because it tries to update all these things and make it feel more, more modern and give it all this, this depth. Uh, like Chris Hemsworth ha is the... You know, other than just being the huntsman who's dragged out in the third act, he's given a, a dead wife backstory and uh, all this all this grief, and he's our broken Han Solo-esque character. Yet, the core concept of the entire story, this uh, women be vengeful bitches, am I right, homies? I kind of felt like the motivation of Charlize Theron was quite sort of feminism backlashy. Oh, yeah. Uh, her main motivation is that men only value women for the beauty and then they use them up and throw them to, to the dogs. And so her only possible recourse is basically mass murder. I. <laughs> <laughs> then, of course, Snow White's da lives down to the stereotype, right? He doesn't pay attention to the pill talk, and so he gets murdered for it. Right, she poisons him, and then she stabs him, just to make sure. <laughs> then she stops his heart, possibly. Maybe. Her magic powers are a little... Ill-defined? Uh, <laughs> yeah, mercurial. Mercure <laughs> <laughs> she can generate an entire army just by thinking about it, and then a little while later it takes everything she has to kill one guy. It does seem a little uneven. Do you think she possibly derives her magical powers from incest? Perhaps, though, I, that was really it was confusing. heavily implied, right? Like, there's a line where she, where she says, I, like, haven't I given you everything? And it has definitely a kind of creepy, sexy brother-sister action vibe. Oh, plus his hair screams, I'm fucking my sister. <laughs> I used to have that haircut. <laughs> <laughs> That's that haircut means either I'm a Nazi or I'm fucking my sister. Perhaps both. Also, he kisses her neck and every. I mean, yeah, yeah, they're fucking, they're <laughs> fucking like mad. They're fucking like like brother sister bunnies, but they uh like like CGI bunnies, which this movie also has. <laughs> right. It's uh, they didn't bother with trained animals for any of the animals. Fuck those animals. Green is universal. The very end of the movie I thought was a little odd. The fact that it just ends with them staring uncomfortably at each other. <laughs> and everybody is kind of like, well, I guess I'll raise my swords or whatever. <laughs> it okay, ends bye. basically the same way as Star Wars, though, right? <laughs> Everyone's yeah, standing I, I, there I, I awkwardly. Have you, ever, have you ever seen the final scene of the first Star Wars movie without the music? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I can imagine it. Yeah, no, no metal for you, pill. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is very similar. Where the love story is just, it, it, it's almost like, wait, wait, were we supposed to infer that or not? Right. I wasn't entirely sure that the love triangle had been resolved, and I was kind of hoping that it would end with sort of a, you know, like a triad thing forming. I was actually thinking that during the whole Joan of Arc storm in the castle section because I was so bloody bored. I was like, <laughs> what, what, could, what could possibly end this so that I could be like, well, it's almost worth it. And I thought, oh, if, if they end up in a triad, if, if, uh, and possibly they do, we, let's, we, we could write that ending in. Yeah, 
Yeah, we'll just we'll just pretend that's how it ended. Cause it just it seriously it's like her not having a speech prepared as she's crowned. <laughs> <laughs> and and just staring at everybody like I I don't I don't know if I'm supposed to say something, so I'll just open my mouth and kind of hunch up and down a bit because that's what I do. And Chris Hemsworth seems as if he's drunk and looking for the bathroom, and, it's... and wanders by and is like, "Oh hey, it's you there?" <laughs> and she's like, "Oh oh yeah, maybe." Maybe he'll say something, and he's like, "No, no, but I got, I got nothing." And no, then oh, the door closes. They didn't write anything for me. <laughs> it feels like there should have been more of an ending. Yeah, it definitely just seemed as though they sort of ran out of film. Th- though perhaps it was setting up a sequel. You could kind of just sort of paste Snow White happily ever after onto this. Uh, having the mirror go from a tall black man and CGI to Dom DeLuise might be a wee confusing. I'll point out also the only black man in this movie. <laughs> That's true. Is is a T-9000. I, I, when that happened, I was like, what the bloody had the, even the fucking mirror got a bloody reboot. Is so ridiculous. The reason I know it's a tall black man is because I looked it up. Like, did they get Max von Sydow to do this part or something? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because the mirror is this gold T9000 who's like, Oh, beauty. I, I was like, what the bloody hell? <laughs> <laughs> he says, it's a fucking mirror. They definitely did try to just mash together as many possible successful movie franchises as they could, didn't they? Like, they've got the ending from Star Wars. They've got definitely a lot of themes from the Lord of the Rings movies. A Harry lot of just Potter? like. Harry Potter? I saw this thing and I, I liked it. Yeah, they've got some Harry Potter stuff in there. And the, the dwarves, of course, n- not only did they clothe them like the dwarves from the Hobbit movies and the Lord of the Rings, they talked a lot like them. And they also really tried to imitate the way the Hobbit movies used. Things like forced perspectives and body doubles and giant puppets and small puppets and that kind of stuff in order to be able to use regular sized people to play dwarves, which I actually found quite annoying. There really are few enough roles in Hollywood for little people that you might as well just cast some rather than get Bob Hoskins and Ray Winstone and Ian McShane and Toby Jones and... All these other normal-sized actors, normal-sized, all these other <laughs> actors of closer to average height. That was really shitty thing to say. Rather than say these freaks, right? <laughs> <laughs> I felt a little betrayed by that because I was like, well, if nothing else, this movie gave some work to, to right. seven little people. There's, there's and then I looked it up and I was people. like, bloody Bob Hoskins is one of them. He's not a little person. Is it sort of on par with painting a white guy black and having him play a black role? Yeah, it it does feel that way because as much as I might like Bob Hoskins normally, though in in this movie he's he's not very well used. He's sort of doing his Richard Dreyfus the whole time. <laughs> he just he just seems like he's taking a lot of quaaludes to me. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe if we went and looked at the Screen Actors Guild listing, perhaps there really are only four little people in the entire world who want to be actors. There's Vern Troyer and uh, Deep Roy. Peter Dinklage. Peter Dinklage. Yeah, I think, no, that's it. So yeah, I guess uh, <laughs> I guess that makes sense. A lot of people gave uh, Tim Burton a lot of shit for when he redid Charlie and the Chocolate Factory because he used Deep Roy for all of the Oompa Loompas instead of hiring a bunch of little people for that. But at least he used one actual little person. <laughs> There's also, uh, what's, what's his name? Is it, is it, I want to say Michael J. Anderson, the little person in the, in uh, Twin Peaks. And then he also, he also played uh, Matthew McConaughey's dad in Twinkle Toes, uh, tip, t- tip Toes, Tip Toes. I believe it's Tip Toes. To go back to the mirror for a second, we have an odd moment in there where her, br- <laughs> her brother looks in upon her and she's talking to the mirror and he can't see the mirror. So was the mirror only in her head? Was right, she yeah. 
imagining that she wasn't the most beautiful. Did she imagine all of this? <laughs> it was strange because he, he saw her talking to herself and it freaked him out to see her talking to herself. But like all the other shit that he sees, literally two minutes earlier, she sucked the youth from a little redheaded girl. <laughs> and that was that was fine. But when she talks to herself, then he's really worried. Also, it's like, she has a lot of magic, obviously. So why put in the idea that uh, maybe the mirror's in her head? Yeah, the mirror also takes an annoyingly long time to boot up, doesn't it? <laughs> it's running on Windows XP. <laughs> This movie was so ponderously paced all the time. Like It took itself so bloody seriously. People walk slowly into rooms and sit down and straighten their tunics and stuff. And sometimes they're in focus and sometimes they're not. I did notice that. It's, it's like, oh, oh, my hand is reaching out for a branch and so it's, it's going into hell of focus because I just, oh, the world is too goddamn difficult. It's a very strange movie. Speaking of other movies that it obviously liked, it must have liked Batman Begins since Chris Hemsworth is introduced, basically playing out the first act of Batman Begins. Right, exactly. I kept writing down, Charlize Theron, you're better than this. <laughs> because her acting was given... <laughs> Give me the scenery! <laughs> it was given... Accolade! <laughs> <laughs> and I don't bloody know why. I would sometimes write down lines that I could finish myself. I think my favorite was where she... They put up the giant symbol that's apparently a magic mirror. And um, they're like, okay, I guess you're good to play drums now. <laughs> and and she mumbles in a corner, out. And it's like, okay, she's going to scream out next. And then <laughs> like, there's like five seconds and they're like... Okay, let's get this symbol just right. And she's like, oh, it just, oh, my God. It was so fucking ridiculous at all times. She whispered or screamed every single line. I think that possibly she had just gone to the Nicolas Cage School of Acting and she was employing what she'd learned there. I like Nicolas Cage. You shut the hell up. <laughs> You bloody pants. <sighs> it, it, it felt like she needed a mustache to twirl. That should have happened when she got ugly, right? She got a mustache and then started twirling. <laughs> and she was like, ah, damn you. Damn you, Dudley, dude. I, I'll get you next time. She was definitely, definitely a bit over the top. There's a great line where a, a, a man just screams at us, where is my son? And I scream back <laughs> at him, who are you? <laughs> I still don't know who that man was. <laughs> uh, there was a scene where they were putting together a party to go into the into the dark forest in order to hunt after Snow White. Why didn't they go to that party of men first? <laughs> right? It's like, he's the only one who knows the dark forest except for these seven very sinister men. <laughs> he says, do you need a bowman? And my first thought was, no, but if you'd like to roll up a tank or a healer... <laughs> <laughs> my reaction to that film was i'm gonna try that a job in a video <laughs> do you need a data analyst oh no oh, yeah. we have one <laughs> just arrow him in the heart and then say do you need a data analyst yeah it'd probably work on american idol as well if it hadn't been cancelled oh it got cancelled they eh? finally bloody cancelled american idol today i thought that thing was like a troll it would never die speaking of troll i was I was thinking about how very silly Chris Hemsworth must have looked when he was acting that scene without benefit of a troll. I tried to imagine him just flailing and splashing around in that stream all by himself. And then, of course, Kristen Stewart comes out from behind the rock and not Dwayne Johnson. She's hiding behind more like a tree right. stump. And scenery. they have w uh, one of the few pieces of scenery that Charlize Theron hadn't chewed up by that point. <laughs> Uh, actually, I'm pretty sure that troll was Charlie's Theron, and she was just <laughs> chewing on that stump. They they make this sort of special connection, and it mm -hmm. uh, I think it's because of the unspoken pact of mouth breathers. Do you think if Chris Hemsworth hadn't come around, would she have made out with that troll? <laughs> 
Possibly. I also think she was going to make out with the stag later on. <laughs> was I the only one that found it rather alarming when those creepy little fairies jumped out of the magpie chests like alien chest busters? Oh, I thought they were supposed to be riding them and it was just badly animated. It, it's possible. It's hard, <laughs> hard to tell. Because it, sure it looked like down. one of them climbed down from it and one of them kind of walked through the other one. Yeah, that was... I, I don't know. It, they looked like aliens to me. They they were a little weird, uh, as well as the, uh, you mentioned before, the butterflies in the dead carcass. There was a lot of, like, beauty versus death, and it was just, it was so ageist. It was like, death equals old people, and it smells weird, and it'll ruin your kingdom. And your shoes. Did you notice how, in certain shots, it was very obvious that Chris Hemsworth just had plastic axes taped to his ass? <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I, I did. They were, they clearly weighed nothing, and they were sort of flexible sometimes. Because he'd have he'd have crossed axes on his ass, and then he'd sit down, and you'd go, "Wait, where's where have the axes gone?" I also loved how at one point an archer fires an arrow at Snow White, and dun, dun! I'm gonna play out the music while you tell this story. And one of the dwarves, dun, dun. while the arrow is flying through the air. He has enough time to shout arrow and jump in front of it in order to protect her. Right, and that's Gus's death, all right? Because, of course, oh, one yeah, of the bloody dwarves, huh? Yeah, one of the bloody dwarves has to die. Poor Gus. Yeah, we barely knew him. <laughs> and uh, Snow White's healing magic doesn't do so much for Gus. Right, well, uh, she's supposed to be magical, right? I, I didn't quite understand. She was just sort of the forest messiah. Yeah, she brings uh, nature back to life, but I guess not real people. Chris Hemsworth gets the line when talking about his dead wife. I let her out of my sight, and she was gone. And I was like, were you married when you were two? Did you not have any object permanence at that point? <laughs> talking about the pace, I think my favorite thing to slow down the pace was when they're all riding along the beach, and it would just suddenly go slow-mo, and it's case to, like, <laughs> hunching on a horse, trying to look all Joan of arc as much as possible, and then that, that poor guy flailing about on the beach with the arrow stuck in him, <laughs> in really slow-mo. It's only, like, a half-second, but it's a half-second that is not necessary at all, and just serves for the movie to be like... Just in case you forgot how bloody serious we take ourselves. There were a lot of un unanswered questions for me, speaking of watching Case to ride a horse. Um, <laughs> she's basically been in prison her entire life. How I did does she think have, about that like, a lot. the muscle stamina to run for hours on end? How does she know how to ride a horse, much less bareback and without benefit of a bridle or reins? I, I kept thinking of Kill Bill throughout this because that's something that annoyed the piss out of me with Kill Bill because I've had surgery where I had to not move for three days afterwards and it took like two days of getting my muscles back used to where the new center of gravity was because uh, when you're lying on your back your body adapts to that as the center of gravity and I know Kestu had like a 10 by 10 settle so she wasn't on her back the entire time but it's like was she like Clay Eastwood in Escape from Alcatraz, like constantly doing push-ups and shit to, to keep herself in great shape? I also wondered what good the candles in her cell were, given that she didn't have matches. That's a very good point. <laughs> I assume Creepy Brother just came in and lit them while he molested her. Oh, yeah, there was definitely some, some implication of that having been going on for a while as well, wasn't there? Creepy Brother gets around. I mean, that haircut, that implies I'm fucking a princess against a will. <laughs> if only if only he'd had a better editor, he'd still be with us today. Perhaps. And as far as irony goes, you know, sort of our first scenes between Chris Hemsworth, uh, I'm just going to start calling him Thor, between yeah. Thor and Bella, uh, that when they're walking through the forest and they're creating this ironic tension by him saying, damn all royalty, they're no good at all, and the king was a prat, and he <laughs> let the evil queen into the kingdom, this is all his fault. I poo on him. And Bella's going, 
No, no, surely it's not as bad as all that. It was just so ham-fisted in their attempt to create the ironic tension that would drive the wedge between them in Act 2. It was so transparently fake. It drove me crazy. I could see it coming. I don't fault it for being formulaic and straightforward. I fault it for being so bloody bad at it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, 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 we get it. Get, get, get to the point. This movie just all over. It's like, well, where's the plot? You know, it's. I, I mean, it, it's like if it's her regaining her throne, we don't need all of this bloody horseshit. And why was William even in the film? I know. What the fuck was his purpose? Even it seemed as if his entire point was he's the prince charming, and that the huntsman is a red herring. But then it's the huntsman's kiss that awakens her. Why is that? He was a double bluff. Aye, but we didn't <laughs> need that. It's it's never very clear because the bloody language about the magic in the movie doesn't make much sense. But it's like, it sounded as if a pure heart was needed in order to wake her up. What? How is the huntsman purer than William? I thought it was supposed to be true love's kiss. Isn't that what's supposed to awaken her? In in Snow White, in the story of Sto Snow White, isn't it true love's kiss? Oh, I, I believe so. Yeah. And at least it makes a little bit of sense that he actually knows her, unlike William, who basically hasn't seen her since she was a child. I don't know if I agree with that, though, because William has spent his entire life Thinking she to was her. dead. Well, yeah, but he had... I mean, he was immediately willing to... Uh, throw away his entire life to go save her. To me, that's dedication. Aye. It's meant to be a red herring, but I, it's a little more believable of a red herring than whatever the hell was going on with Hemsworth. I mean, I the only time that we get anything approaching any sort of romantic chemistry between them is he says, you kind of remind me of my dead wife. Which is not creepy at all. No, and then he molests a comatose body. <laughs> right. Totally, totally fine. That's a, a lot of bad lessons in this film. <laughs> yeah, if you see a dead chick, just kiss her. What's the worst that could happen? <laughs> I did think that William's kiss of her dead or unconscious body was a little more lingery than was really necessary. It was definitely getting into creepy territory, and I was sort of expecting him to go, uh, okay, guys, that didn't work. Now, um, stick with me. <laughs> hear me out. <laughs> Just hear me out. <laughs> I was kind of wondering where his right hand was during that scene. Because <laughs> it kind of moves out of frame, and the frame ends at about a decolletage. <laughs> Agreed, uh, Hemsworth seems a little more appropriate, mostly because... There is no romantic fire behind it. It's just, uh, well, it was fun traveling with you, Queenie. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, yet that wakes her up for no apparent reason. And then she goes out and hunches at everybody and screams <laughs> that bloody brilliant line. <laughs> I would rather die today than live another day of this death. To which one of the men replies, all right then, and cuts her head off. <laughs> She also had a really great line there where she was, she said, I will be your weapon. And I was thinking, yeah. not literally though, right? You are going to get them some actual weapons, right? I, re I, I really thought perhaps it would turn into a mecha type movie at that point. Like she and the <laughs> queen might get in giant uh, Warhammer type metal outfits and duke it out. I, I did think, oh, that'll be cool, but she did not really become that weapon. <laughs> she also gets the line at, at the very end when she's just looking at the queen, who somehow, even, even though she, she stamped her in the gut, she appears to have been punctured in the lung because the breathing keeps getting more and more staccato. And she just stares at her and says, you can't have my heart. And it's like, o okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm using it. <laughs> I know, and it was like, what? How? How does that relate to anything? Well, there was a there was a pretty clear implication there that she had already given her heart to someone, and that was why the queen couldn't have her heart. And I actually did give them a little bit of props for for not finishing that obscenely cheesy line, but they do also lose all of said props for having started it. 
I did not get that at all <laughs> from it. I thought it was just her saying like, maybe I could give you a kidney. Did I get you a kidney? Do you think it would be any good to you right now? Uh... But but you can't have my heart because it powers the blood through my system. You see? Or I... it was just her. I thought it was just her taunting her. And like, I can't you grow can't another stop one. my heart. Ha 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 ha. I'm better than you because I'm young and hot. Look at these tits. Look at these tits, Look Charlize at Theron. You'll never have that pertness again. But perhaps it was what you were saying. I'll, I'll run with that as a possibility. All right. If you could change one thing about this movie and make it better, what would it be? That the final fight scene took place in Zords. Like Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, basically like you were suggesting, big mechanized robot suits. That would be, uh, that would definitely fix the movie. And like boom, boom, boing, boom, 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 sort of music. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, <laughs> and there'd be like a six-minute-long tooling up and powering up scene. <laughs> Mine is uh slightly similar, and that's just that because this movie was so bloody pompous and just so full of itself, it was it was like this balloon that needed popping. So so my thought is, you just take the entire movie, and every time somebody jumps down onto something or looks up really fast or anything like that, you add some boing! Sound effects, just to just to puncture a little bit of that hot hair that's uh, throughout the entire movie. Just put some goofy sound effects through every goddamn thing. Like when <laughs> when uh, when the little people walk, you just put like <laughs> and when Chris Hemsworth uh, uh, it gets punched around, just boing! things like that. What if you ended it with everyone getting arrested? <laughs> <laughs> They all they all get put in the bloody police lorry. Aye. So it seems as though that about wraps it up. This podcast must be over. <laughs> all right. Thank you, everybody, for sticking with us. Please, if you have any feedback, write us at info at iceonmars.net. Visit iceonmars.net. For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. And J. Wilford Neville. I'm so glad we're done with this goddamn movie. <laughs> Aye. 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 <laughs> You have been listening to Ice on Mars. <laughs> <laughs>